Good morning. We're going to get started. Can everybody hear me? Can you guys hear me? If you can't hear me, you need to probably move more to the center and hopefully uh, that'll help you out. But I got a new amplifier, so my in the church fault with that. So uh, that's not the problem now. If the problem now, if you can't hear me, is you. Okay. Certainly couldn't be my problem. It has to be your problem. Anyhow, uh, once again, we have northeast winds and high tide and it was raining this morning and some people came early and but we're here now and thank god for you uh coming out uh i have i do have some announcements though um wednesday night of course is our bonfire bible study we're still doing that uh it's seven o'clock at my house i'm sorry that was me and that was the important part of the announcement um next week we're changing the time to 6 30. So 6 30 on the Wednesday night Bible study. And I'm sure for all you old folks out here that have to be in bed by 7 30, Carol. I'm sure you won't, Carol. For all you old folks that have to be in bed by 7 30, this is going to make a, a big change for you. It's going to help you out. We're going to meet at 6 30 on Wednesday night. And uh, I don't know why it's taking us so long to figure that out, but we're going to do it at 6 30. Directions are on the cards there in front of the offering box here to my house. Um, so you have no excuse. We're going through the life of David. So I'd encourage you to be a part of that on Wednesday night. And uh, coming up in two weeks, we normally don't announce things that far out because everybody's short-term memory is failing at this point in their life. But, um, but we need to make sure that you know about the ladies' tea, which is coming up on Saturday, October 5th. And uh, it's important that you are aware of that because there's a sign-up sheet for things to bring as far as food and so forth. But the ladies' annual tea happens every time, every year around this time. Uh, it's gonna be on the same weekend as our men's prayer breakfast and what normally would be the women's prayer uh, or uh, Bible study time. Instead, they're gonna be doing their annual tea on that Sunday or that Saturday. And the time for them is changing as well. It's gonna be 11 a.m. It's gonna be at Wendy's house. Uh, directions and there's cards back there. I think Wendy made these beautiful invitations. Uh, See so ladies, make sure you get one of those and, and uh, put it on your refrigerator or whatever and also sign up for something to bring as far as food goes. Um, and then, of course, the men will be meeting that morning at 8 a.m. At, at Bethany Diner, as usual. All right, that's all the announcements I think I have. Um, I will reiterate, though, that with the hurricane season and the inclement weather we've been having, always check here first. And if we're not, if, if not going to be able to meet here, we'll have a, uh, a sign out front and also usually someone standing there directing you over to the conference center. We meet at the Christian Conference Center and some people went there this morning, so they obviously knew where that was, but it's just to the left of the, to or to the right of the totem pole if you're looking away from the beach. We meet in the dining hall there and uh, you can find us there when um, it's bad weather. But thank the Lord, even though we had some rain this morning, it seems to have stopped and uh, we're gonna hope that uh, he'll allow us to continue our service here this morning. Well, let's open our service with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence here with us this morning. We thank you that God does not dwell in temples made with hands, but he dwells in the hearts of his people. Jesus said, where two or three of you are gathered together, there I will be in the midst. And so Lord, we invite you here this morning as we worship you, as we learn from you, as we study your, your teaching, we pray, Lord, that you would instruct us in the way that we ought to go, how we are to live, what we are to know, what we are to believe. And we ask that you would encourage us and strengthen us. We know, Lord, that there are many in our church that are sick, 
We pray for those especially who are struggling with a, a, a severe illness right now. We know some are looking at, at very severe cancer. Father, we just pray for healing for those people, for deliverance. We pray that you'd be with them and watch over them. Watch over now this service and bless it, Lord, we pray. Encourage our hearts and strengthen us, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, we're gonna start by singing, Great is thy faithfulness. Should be alphabetical in your book. Church arrives. <laughs> Just talking with someone before the service on what the church was supposed to be doing. What are, what's our job? What are we supposed to be doing? What is the church job in the world? And this church, uh, this song actually addresses that. What you're supposed to be doing as the church. And if you're saved, if you've been born again by the Spirit of God, then you're part of the church. You're not part of a church because you've signed a letter, but because you have been born 
into the church of God. So church arise. Oh, church, arise and put your armor on. Hear the call of Christ our captain. For now the weak can say that they are strong in the strength that God has given. With shield of faith and belt of truth, we'll stand against the devil's lies. An army gold, whose battle cry is love, reaching out to those in darkness. Our call to war, to love the captive soul, but to rage against the captor and with the sword that makes the wounded whole we will fight with faith and valor when faced with trials on every side we know the outcome is secure and Christ will have the price for which he died, an inheritance of nation. Come see the cross where love and mercy meet, as the Son of God is stricken. Then see his foes lie crushed beneath his feet, for the conqueror has risen. And as the stone is rolled away, and Christ emerges from the grave, his victory march continues till the day, every eye and heart shall see him. So spirit come, put strength in every stride, Give grace for every hurdle That we may run with faith to win the prize Of a servant good and faithful As saints of old still line the way Retelling triumphs of His grace We hear their calls and hunger for the day when with Christ we stand in glory. All right, you may be seated. Dick Irwin is going to come up and read Psalm 26 for us today as part of our worship service. So, Dick. Good morning, church. Turn to your Bibles to Psalm 26. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my mighty integrity. I have also trusted in the Lord. I shall not slip. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. For my mind and my heart, for your loving kindness is before my eyes. And I have walked in your truth. I have not sought with idolatrous mortals, nor will I go with the Hippocrates. I have hated the assembly of the evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. I will wash my hands in innocence, so I will go about your altar, O Lord, that I may proclaim with the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all your wondrous works. Lord, I have loved the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells do not gather my soul with sinners nor my life with bloodthirsty men in, the, in whose hands is a sinister scheme and whose right hand is full of bribes but as for me I will walk in my integrity redeem me and be merciful to me my foot stands in an even place in my congregations, I will bless the Lord. Okay, everybody, please pray with me. 
Lord, thank you for this day, even with the wind and all the noise here this after this morning. Uh, we know that you're here with us. Lord, we bless everyone that's here. We bless Roy. We bless the message that he's given this morning. Lord, please be with us as we spend this time with you. Thanks to you. Amen. Let's turn in our Bibles to John chapter 7. If we have a Bible. You have a phone app that'll work but remember the holy spirit can see you when you check your email so you're not allowed to do that god ain't on uh facebook i'm afraid <clears throat> john chapter 7 after these things, Jesus was walking in Galilee, for he was unwilling to walk in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the feast of the Jews, the feast of booths, was near. Therefore his brothers said to him, leave here and go into Judea, so that your disciples also may see the works which you are doing. For no one does anything in secret when he himself seeks to be known publicly. If you do these things, Show yourself to the world, for not even his brothers were believing in him. So Jesus said to them, My time is not yet here, but your time is always opportune. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its deeds are evil. Go up to the feast yourselves. I do not go up to this feast because my time has not yet fully come. Having said these things to him, to them, he stayed in Galilee. But when his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he himself also went up, not publicly, but as if, if, but as if in secret. So the Jews were seeking him at the feast and were saying, where is he? There was much grumbling among the crowds concerning him. Some were saying he is a good man. Others were saying, no, on the contrary, he leads the people astray. Yet no one was seeking, op speaking openly of him for fear of the Jews. But when it was now the midst of the feast, Jesus went up to the temple and began to teach. The Jews then were astonished, saying, How has this man become learned, having never been educated? So Jesus answered them and said, My teaching is not of mine, but his who sent me. If anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak for myself. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. But he who is seeking the glory of the one who sent him, he is true, and there is no unrighteousness in him. The millions of people today claim to know Jesus, to believe in Jesus. They are attracted to Jesus. Yet Jesus himself said that many are called, but few are chosen. That many will seek to enter his kingdom, but will not be able. Though many claim to be Christians, there's a tremendous difference between true and false disciples. 2,000 years ago, even Jesus' own family did not believe in him, and his own nation rejected him and put him to death. Even after feeding 5,000, 5, which we now have said is, should have been 15,000 people, and healing many of the sick in attendance there, when he began to preach his gospel, many of the disciples, it says, stopped following him. John 6, 66 says, as a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. These fair weather disciples who came for the miracles but left after the message were obviously superficial. They were disciples or followers in name only. They were still the 12, however, his inner circle. And when the others left him, Jesus turned to them and said, you do not want to go away also, do you? And Peter acting as the spokesman answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. 
We have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. But even within the 12, Jesus said that one of them had a demon and would betray him. So Jesus' ministry was characterized by true and false disciples. I believe much of Jesus' teaching was to show a distinction between his followers, to separate those that followed him for superficial reasons and to develop true discipleship. Jesus seemed to almost go out of his way to talk people out of following him. Let me just give you a few examples. To the 15,000 people who had just eaten of the loaves and fishes that he had miraculously provided, Jesus said, if you want to continue, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. That's why they said many stopped following him after that. At another time, Jesus told those who wished to follow him to let the dead bury the dead and not even to go to their father's funeral. He told a rich young ruler to sell everything he had and give it to the poor. And then he could follow him. At another time, he told a crowd that unless they hated their father and their mother and family and even their own life, they could not be his disciples. Then he told them to pick up their cross. The cross was a, a symbol of torture. Pick up their cross and follow him. He said in Luke chapter 14, verse 33, So then none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all of his own possessions. Jesus told others to leave their nets. He was talking to fishermen, and that was the way they made their living. He told them to leave their nets, and he would make them fishers of men. I could go on and on, give you more and more examples. Jesus called disciples to abandon all that they held dear in the world for the sake of knowing him. Unfortunately, this call to forsake everything or all for Christ is not the gospel message of the modern church today. We've changed the message to be as accommodating and as appealing as possible. We don't ask for anyone to leave anything, but just come as you are. We don't ask for any sort of personal sacrifice, but say all God wants is a relationship with you because he loves you so much. If we're not careful, we will find that we have redefined discipleship, if not even redefined salvation. We are guilty of twisting the Jesus of the Bible into a 21st century hipster kind of Christ that people are more comfortable with. Jesus becomes a non-condemning, non-controversial genie who is able to grant wishes upon our command and more importantly, place no demands upon us. But that's not the Jesus of the Bible. Jesus never presented discipleship as being easy. The Jesus of the Bible talked about offering himself as a human sacrifice for sin and man's need to repent for the forgiveness of sins. And the people consequently rejected him. When he confronted religious leaders of his day as hypocrites, in response, they hated him and plotted to kill him. Don't let me get run over by these waves back there. Ian's got a little shovel. Ian's got a little shovel. He's going to save the planet with that shovel right here. You're going to save my amp and guitar, hopefully. You ready, Ian? Uh, he, but he dug that little trench there like that's going to do something. But he, but he did do it after I told him to do it. So if you're going to blame somebody, blame me. At least he was, a, he was like, that's crazy, but I'll be obedient. I'll do it. So the Bible says in chapter 7, verse 1, that Jesus avoided going to Judea because it was the seat of religious authority in Israel and because he knew that the people there wanted him dead, the religious leaders wanted him dead. His home was actually in a small city called Capernaum in Galilee, which had a population of about 1,500 people where everybody knew who you were. 
Everybody knew your name. We can assume that it was the family home. And so about six months after the feeding of the multitudes on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, his brothers came to him and said, leave here and go into Judea so that your disciples also may see your works, which you're doing, for no one does anything in secret when he himself seeks to be known publicly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. Now, from a logical perspective, what they said seemed to make sense. It seemed to be good advice for how to raise up a ministry, or in Jesus' case, how to get everyone to recognize and believe that you are the Messiah. But their motive was not really in the best interest of the kingdom of God. Their underlying motivation for their comments is found in verse 5. It says, for not even his brothers were believing in him. So at this point, even his own brothers were not true disciples. They were perhaps willing to benefit from a familiar relationship with him if in fact he could perform some sort of coup in a geopolitical realm, but in fact they did not really believe that their own brother was the Messiah, much less the Son of God. In chapter 6, you'll remember the crowds were taken aback by Jesus claiming to have, have come down out of heaven. And they said in verse 42, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down out of heaven? And now in chapter 7, you have the brothers agreeing with that statement. After all, they had grown up in the same home with Jesus. They shared the same parents, or so they thought. How could Jesus have come down from heaven? Matthew's gospel tells us who his brothers were. Matthew 13, 54 said he came to his hometown and began teaching them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and in his own household. And he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. So from that text, we know that the people in Jesus' home hometown didn't believe that he was the Messiah. And in John 7, we learn that even his brothers didn't believe him. That explains why they say, if you do these things, Show them to the world, if you do. They didn't even believe that he had done any real miracle. Now there's a parallel here in the life of Joseph from the Old Testament. Joseph was hated by his brothers because they were jealous of him. And so they scorned him and eventually plotted his death. Jesus' brothers did not actually, or Joseph's brothers did not actually kill him but they did reject him and really wanted him out of their lives. He was an irritation to them. And in like manner, Jesus, greater brethren, meaning the family of the Jewish nation, plotted his death. But the Bible does indicate that Jesus' actual brothers did eventually come to believe in him. Even as Joseph's brothers eventually came to bow down before him. But it was not until after Christ's resurrection, which you can read about in Acts chapter 1, verse 14. Tradition, the Bible doesn't tell us everything, but tradition tells us that Simon, his brother, became a servant of the church for many years. And James, his brother, became the author of the book of James, the leader of the church in Jerusalem. He became a martyr for the faith. He describes himself in his epistle as James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, establishing Jesus as Lord, Messiah, and equal with God. Jude, another brother, the author of the book of Jude, describes himself also as a servant of Jesus Christ. Christ means Messiah, so Jesus the Messiah. And he writes about looking for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ for eternal life. So his brothers eventually come to recognize him as the Son of God. And you know what I'm going to say? This is not in my notes, but it, it irritates me so much I'm going to say it. 
I know my wife was just talking to the women about the, uh, Mary and so forth. But in order to substantiate the Catholic Church claim that Mary was a virgin until the day she was assumed into heaven and she never sinned, they say that his brothers were not actually his brothers, they were his half-brothers, they were actually born of Joseph or something else, but, but Mary never had any other children. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. You're making it up, and you're making it up simply to support the other er 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 uh, erroneous claim, which is that Mary was without sin, and she was assumed into heaven. Search the scriptures for yourself, folks, and see if such things would be true, and you'll find that they're not. So, anyhow, I'm sorry I got off on that, but um, his brothers, though, his real brothers, his actual brothers, born of Mary, eventually come to recognize him as the Son of God. But at this stage, they're still filled with contempt and scorn for him. Though they could claim to have a relationship with him, yet they cannot claim true discipleship. Their suggestions are indicative or indicative, I think is the proper way to pronounce that, indica indicative of his faults of uh, disciples as well. They basically are espousing the dogma of modern Christian evangelism. That if you're successful, if you can draw a big crowd, then you must be doing something right. That's why they wanted him to go to Judea. Why hide out in the backwoods of Galilee when the big crowds and the big success was in Judea? Why not, you know, if you're really the Messiah, you're gonna to have to become popular with the multitudes and accepted by everyone. But notice that's not Jesus' plan for changing the world. In chapter six, Jesus spent about two days teaching the 15,000 people, but many of them then deserted him. And then the next six months, there's no mention of what Jesus did other than he spent time primarily with just 12 guys his inner circle, discipling him. That was his plan for establishing the kingdom of God in the world. And Jesus' commission is the same for us today. Matthew 28, 19 says, go therefore and make, what? Disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. The command there is not to go into football stadiums and attract large crowds, nor to organize giant crusades and get a lot of people to walk the aisle and say a, the presented sinner's prayer, but to make disciples and teach them, notice that, teach them to observe all that I commanded you. Attracting a crowd is easy if you have enough money. Never forget when we used to, before we became a church, we were surfer, Christian surfers, and we did a, a big outreach in Ocean City. And some guy gave us like $15,000 to help us advertise. We had airplanes flying down the beach, advertising our outreach, and, and we had full page or half page ads in the papers and so forth. And we attracted a large crowd. We filled up the convention center down in Ocean City, and we thought it was great. Well, you can do that, if you have a lot of money. But many people deserted Jesus afterwards when they found out the true cost of discipleship. So for the next six months, Jesus spent his time with just 12 guys. Now this reason his brothers made the suggestion for Jesus to go to Judea was because it was the time of the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles. There were three feasts that the Jewish men were required to go to Jerusalem, to physically go travel to Jerusalem to celebrate. And the Feast of Tabernacles was one of those feasts, which lasted seven days. So from a human perspective, it would be a great opportunity for Jesus to appear before every able-bodied man in, in Israel and do some miracles and show everyone that indeed he was the Messiah. And that's another indication of false disciples, by the way. They are attracted by signs and wonders. Great crusades happen in our country all the time, which claim to be visited by signs and wonders. 
Just a few years ago, one happened in Los Angeles, known as the City of the Angels. I guess that gave this guy idea. Because one of the organizers of that event claimed to see a giant golden angel up in the sky as he was driving into the facility. Their whole program was about signs and wonders. One speaker announced that everyone there after the service was over was gonna be able to walk behind someone afterwards and know everything that that person was about. They would know everything about that person. I guess that's what they consider a word of knowledge. There were people who were there acting drunk in the spirit all over the auditorium, falling down and laughing uncontrollably. But the Bible warns about such signs and wonders as a means of leading people into false discipleship. Matthew 24, 4 says, for false Christ and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders. So to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Jesus rebuked others who followed him for seeking signs and wonders. In John chapter 4, verse 48, Jesus said, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. And Paul warned in 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 about those whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. So Jesus is not, is not interested in accommodating man's agenda, even if it's his own family members who are pushing it. So he responds, his response is, my time is not yet here, but your time is always opportune. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it, that his deeds are evil. Go up to the feast yourselves. I do not go up to this feast because my time has not yet fully come. There are a couple points I wanna make about this statement. First of all, God has his own timetable and his own agenda, and we need to be aligned with that rather than trying to get God to accommodate our agenda. Jesus had an appointed time that he was going to go to Jerusalem and present himself as the Messiah. It would be six months later at the Passover feast. At that time, Jesus will ride into Jerusalem on a donkey and the crowds will celebrate his coming as the Messiah, the son of David. But a week later, he is crucified as the very same crowds turn against him. He's crucified as the Lamb of God slain for the salvation of the world. That is the timing of God. And Jesus in full, is in full agreement with that plan. This was the plan of God before the foundation of the world. And though it doesn't look like it to his brothers or his disciples, everything is going according to God's plan. Listen, I've said before that there is no safer place to be than in the will of God. And there is no safe place outside of the will of God. It should be a great comfort to us to know that we are in the will of God so that even when it seems like everything is going wrong, we can trust that God is still in control and he has a plan and everything is going according to his plan. And if you're gonna be a disciple of Christ, then you have to get in tune with the timing of God and then trust in his sovereignty to accomplish his will in his time. And all of anxiety, it's usually because we have a different timetable and different expectations of what God's plan is. You know, trusting God is hard work. Faith is hard work. The idea that faith is easy is contrary to scripture. It's hard to walk by faith and not by sight. I heard a story that illustrates trust, faith. The setting was back in the day when televisions still required an antenna up on the roof in order to be able to get any reception, something that we no longer have to worry about, I guess. But this man was up on the roof fixing his television antenna when he slipped and began to slide down the roof toward the gutters. He tried to catch himself, but he went over the edge and at the last second, he managed to grab hold of the rain gutter as he dropped and he hung there suspended two floors in the air. He didn't want to look down. 
And in his desperation, he cried out, Oh God, help! And a voice answered, I am ready to help. And he said, Well, tell me what to do. And the voice asked, Do you trust me? He said, Yes, I trust you. The voice said, All right then, let go. And the man asked, Is there anybody else up there that can help? He didn't really like what God had to say. Now that's being foolish and God didn't actually speak to this guy. And forgive me if I'm a little blasphemous here. But trusting God isn't always easy. Letting go of things we depend upon, though, is fundamental to really trusting in God. Secondly, if you're on God's timetable, doing God's will, then you are in opposition to the world, and the world is going to hate you. The true disciples are hated by the world. But contrarily, false disciples love the world. And so the world does not hate him. Now, why is this true? Well, first of all, it's true because Jesus just said it. But secondly, it's true because if you are a true disciple, then you're going to agree with what Jesus said. It hates me because I testify of it that his deeds are evil. That's the reason. Jesus called sin evil. We call sin evil. And we testify that their deeds are evil. Let me tell you something. This is the defining point of true disciples versus false disciples. The defining point between true and false disciples is their deeds, is their deeds. Now don't get me wrong, you're not saved by works, you're saved by grace. But don't get Jesus wrong either. He said, you shall know them by their fruits. The most damning statement of Jesus was towards false disciples found in Matthew 7 20 he said so then you will know them by their fruits not everyone who says to me Lord Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven but he who does the will of my father who is in heaven will enter many will say to me on that day Lord Lord did not we prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So their fruits are the deeds which they did. But notice though, they did signs and wonders. They even cast out demons and performed many miracles. They named the name of Jesus. And yet they were not true disciples because they practiced sin. Now that's exactly what Jesus accused the Jews of in verse 19. He said to them, Did not Moses give you the law, and yet no, none of you carries out the law? Why do you seek to kill me? They claimed the righteousness of the law, but they did not carry out the law. They sought to kill him in opposition to the law. You know, their hatred of Jesus is equal to murder. So it was begat a murder plot which was eventually fulfilled. If you're a true disciple of Christ, then the world will hate you. That really is the irony of what we call the seeker-friendly church model, isn't it? That we would try to ingratiate ourselves to those who really hate what we're standing for. Because what we stand for is the truth of God's word, which declares that sin is evil and defines sin by God's law. Well, Jesus did eventually go up to the Feast of Tabernacles, but he went secretly. That means he didn't enter the Jerusalem with a big fanfare, with a big entourage. His family would have been part of a large caravan, would have been part of thousands of people coming. That would have probably instigated a big political rally or something, trying to make him a king. But he was not interested in their agenda. He was interested in fulfilling God's agenda. So he shows up privately, secretly without fanfare. And when they do find him, he's teaching in the temple. But notice there was grumbling going on amongst the people in verse 12. There was much grumbling going on among the crowds concerning him. Some were saying, he's a good man. Others were saying, no, on the contrary, he leads the people astray. Yet no one was speaking openly of him for fear of the Jews. Neither of those comments are the marks of true disciples. Jesus was not just a good man. 
Either he was God incarnate or he was a lunatic. He was an imposter. Many of the world's false religions say that Jesus was a good man, but they fail to believe that he is God, that he is alive, having risen from the dead and ascended to heaven and is standing at the Father's right hand. And as such, their belief is of no avail. Believing that Jesus is a good man will not save you. Of course, the other half of the people were under the influence of religious leaders who were saying that he was the deceiver. But neither group were professing saving faith. And neither group spoke openly about him for fear of the Jews. That word Jews is used of religious leaders. They feared being ostracized or kicked out of the temple because of any allegiance that they might show towards Christ. You know, I believe the day is coming when being a true disciple of Christ will bring persecution in the social arena. When saying that certain deeds are sinful will cost you your job or mean you are sued for everything you have and then some or even thrown in jail. That day is here. We saw that happened quite recently. So Jesus starts teaching in the temple and the Jews hearing him ask in astonishment, how has this man become learned? Have he never been educated? You know, that's the great thing about preaching the word of God. It is the wisdom of God. The Holy Spirit working in us in conjunction with the word of God teaches us the things of God so that we have the wisdom of God. You want wisdom? Read the Word of God. 1 Corinthians 1.25 says, The foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger. Notice Jesus says in verse 7, 16, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak for myself. You know, Jesus spoke the words of God. When he rebuked the devil in the wilderness, he spoke, he quoted the word of God. That's the habit of Jesus whenever he preached. He was preaching the word of God. And I think it's a good habit for preachers to get into as well, to preach the word of God. Jesus goes on, goes on to say, he who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. But he who is seeking the glory of the one who sent him, he is true and there is no unrighteousness in him. We have a lot of glory-seeking preachers out there today who speak in order to glorify themselves. They speak to gain a crowd, to please people, to entertain people. And they fail to preach the full counsel of God. Jesus testified that people's sin was evil. Let me tell you real quick, because my wife was talking to me about this the other day. You want to be able to discern whether or not a teacher Maybe you like, like listening to somebody on the radio or the TV or YouTube or whatever. You want to discern whether or not they're a, a true, true uh, prophet or, of God or not. One, one quick one is, is do they preach about sin? If they don't preach about sin, then you can automatically know right there that they're not truly a prophet of God, a, a preacher of God. They're preaching something that is intended to, to, uh, to get people to like you, to get people to accept you, to get people's approval, because they want to make it as easy as possible. All you have to do is just praise God or, or look to God. You don't have to actually repent of anything. But if you want to know the difference real quick, a real quick test, that's, that's one good thing right there to test people by. Whether or not they teach, sin is actually sin. And it's something we need to repent of and when actually something we need to turn away from. Here's, the, here's what Jesus says about that. He says, if anyone is willing to do his will, he's speaking of the Father's will, he will recognize that the teaching is of God. You have to come to a point of being willing to submit and obey the will of God. And when you do that, when you obey, then God will reveal more truth to you. This is one principle I've mentioned again many times, that of progressive revelation. When you are obedient to the light God has shown you so far, then he will reveal more to you. 
God's word is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. That means it's walking revelation. As you walk out the truth in obedience, God will continue to lead you. Too many people want to see the light at the end of the tunnel before they start to walk. That's not true discipleship. Believe and obey. Trust and obey. Well, there's a lot more to this message that Jesus is going to give during this feast, but it's going to have to wait for next Sunday. In the meantime, I believe that you've been given enough light to start to be obedient to the light that you have. I hope that you will prove to be a disciple this week by your deeds and not just your claims on Christianity. I hope indeed that you are a true disciple. If not, then today is the appointed day of salvation. Salvation is simply believing all that Jesus claimed that he was, that he was the bread of life which came down out of heaven, that men might eat of him and receive eternal life. To eat of him simply means to receive him, to believe in him as your Savior and Lord, to be willing to forsake the world, even all that life offers in exchange for eternal life, to be willing to take up your cross and follow him. True discipleship is not without a cost, but the reward is worth it all. Jesus said later in his sermon, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word this morning. We thank you for the message that Jesus gave. We pray, Lord, that we might receive it, believe it, and obey it, and thus prove that we are truly disciples of Christ. We pray that we would repent of our sins and be obedient to the command that he gave. We ask you, Lord, to equip us and enable us to do that by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. We ask these things, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. We're gonna close by singing two stanzas of uh, the one last song. My mind has gone blank here. Come ye sinners, poor and needy. The first two stanzas.
All right, thank you for your attention. See you next Sunday.